Hi everyone, uh, thanks ever so much for, for, for making it, for coming along today, uh, and thanks to uh, Lisa and Methods at Manchester for having me. Um, today um, I'm going to offer a, a methodological exploration of a question which I think is increasingly being asked. So um, if we accept that uh, non-human animals are part of the social life that we study, um, and if we accept that at least some of those non-humans are present during our, our research, or they're, that they're visible to us, um, then how can we include them as ethnographic participants? Or at least give a, a slightly more balanced account of their presence and their experience in our, in our research? Um, is it always impossible? Uh, is, can we only ever really take account of uh, the human perspective in those scenarios? It's obviously extremely difficult, but um, it's, going to be, it's going to be my argument over the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes or so that we can do better, that it's uh, including non-humans in our research is an interesting and a valuable thing to do. Um, and secondly, that methodologically it's possible to get better at observing uh, and being with non-human others so that we can give a slightly more trustworthy account um, of how they make sense of the world around them. I'm particularly interested in the role that sensory methods have to play here, as, as Lisa has said. Um, and I'll be primarily talking about what I learned from one of my own ethnographic research sites um, with horses, where the teaching of horse behaviour and communication um, involves the use of what the facilitator called the felt sense. Um, so I'll explore what was meant by the felt sense in my talk, uh, and I've got a couple of videos to show you as well. Um, and finally, I'll just touch upon how some of these techniques overlap, I think, in quite interesting ways with what I learned during my training as an actor um, and how that's led me to start running workshops in sensory methods and multi-species ethnography. So, um, so I think it's worth perhaps just, just touching briefly on uh, the huge variety of contexts in which we might include non-human animals in our research. Um, and think them worthy of, of sociological investigation, even if they're not directly the subject of our research questions. So when I tell people what I do, most people assume that I'm researching our relationships with dogs or cats, or that I'm interested in the, the benefits that um, animal-assisted therapies can confer on, on, on human participants. And of course, um, we might study the more obvious and immediate human-animal relationships of, of rural societies or non-industrialised societies. But in fact, as the, the sociologist Clifford Bryant uh, Clifton Bryant argued, um, in the West there is virtually no area of our social life that is untouched by animals. Even that, if that relationship isn't um, immediately obvious to us, um, even if those animals are, as, as Carol Adams famously put it in her study of meat, the absent reference uh, in that relationship. He argued that if we want to properly understand a society, then we need to take what he called those zoological connections more seriously. Um, and trace those interdependencies with the more than human, sometimes by going behind the scenes of everyday practices to, um, to observe and, and to participate in those, in those relationships. And doing so can sometimes be quite troubling. Um, I've spent one of my case studies this year in a medical research laboratory with, with uh, mice and, and with primates. Um, but I think it's also a really fascinating and exciting emerging area of research. Um, in an age that we're, where we're con increasingly um, considering our, our ecological location and our, um, how we frame our, our interdependencies with the rest of the non-human world. And if we take a moment to think about it, you know, animals are part of all our lives, um, from the, the milk that we might put on our cereal to the, to the shoes that we wear, to um, food on our plates, the medications that we take, uh, the, the way that they entertain us on telly and on social media, um, the way that animal metaphors pepper our, our moral judgments about others. Um, and they're the subject of intense political debates about their, about their rights, about the extent of their continuity with us, um, and where they should and shouldn't be allowed to live and to populate. They've been part of huge social transformations, so the, the agricultural revolution, uh, the conduct of warfare, the development of biomedicine, climate change. And whether we have direct contact with them or not, we all have uh, an inextricable zoological connection um, and the scale of these mediations I think even in, in highly urbanised lives is, is really quite dizzying and it opens up radically new ways of, of thinking about the social in my, in my opinion. And importantly in, in many cases when we, when we go behind the scenes um, those animals are, are real living breathing creatures. Um, they are, yes, materially affected by the, the kinds of social constructions that we have about them, but they also do stuff. Um, they affect us too. Um, they are actors in the social. 
they make choices and even when we use them for our benefit they collaborate with us or they resist us in, in, in some way. We don't necessarily have to um, consider subjectivity or, or, or conscious intentionality to be, um, to be a, an absolute must here. Um, actor network theory, for example, would, would see that as a limitation. But nonetheless, I think it's a value to recognise that, that scientists and animal study scholars are increasingly recognising that humans aren't the only creatures who have agency, creativity, rationality, um, a sense of self, a sense of other, uh, a sense of, of time. Uh, and the ability to communicate in, in quite sophisticated ways, most of the qualities that we associate with, with culture and with social life. And I'm not just talking about uh, charismatic animals like um, elephants and, and chimps and all those animals that get, um, get headlines. No, I'm talking about rats and mice and fish and chickens and spiders and octopus. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's important to say that this isn't about kind of only sociologically considering those animals that are more like us because that would be anthropocentric in itself but it's about realizing that what we consider um, social behavior and meaning making is distributed across the animal kingdom uh, and not just narrowly limited to homo sapiens as a species um, and of course how we know what we might know about other animals is um, always contingent to some degree and this is the subject of my, my PhD, so I'm comparing and contrasting two different epistemologies of, of animal behaviour expertise, uh, one in a scientific context and one in um, a sort of semi-therapeutic semi context, as we'll find out. Um, but in the humanities, one of the many ways in which we've been trying to understand the experience of animals is through multi-species ethnography. So participant observation uh, and qualitative interpretation in the context of human and non-human interaction. And um, multi-species ethnography as a, as a distinct methodological idea is really quite new um, to the humanities, emerging really only in the last 10 years or so. And it's shared by those in uh, cultural geography, in anthropology, uh, science and technology studies and, and other uh, disciplinary fields. Um, it's been aided by the turn to post-humanism more generally, um, which argues that humans are not the only agents in the world. Um, and it's uh, been helped as well by the, the corporeal turn, or what's, what's sometimes called as a sensorial revolution, um, which argues that uh, social and cultural meanings aren't just located in language, um, but are woven through our gestures, through our bodily interactions, um, through the way that we use space, through material objects, um, and so on. A, a whole variety of information coming through the senses. So in this more expansive definition of what it means to be intersubjective, um, it means that there are now new kinds of researchable entities, as Lindsay Hamilton puts it. Um, and it's in this context that scholars have begun to conduct multi-species ethnography. Um, it should be said not just with non-human animals, but also with, with plants and fungi, um, although it's non-human animals specifically that I'll be talking about in this, in this talk. But in doing so, um, we obviously have to recognise um, a, a fairly obvious methodological problem here. Um, although we can, we can never be sure in our ethnographic work with other humans that we're representing their perspectives with, with any kind of accuracy, you know, language and a, a certain um, uh, shared species physiology uh, is obviously help, you know, of some assistance. Um, but many other uh, animals don't have verbal communications in the same way that we do. Um, they often inha inhabit very uh, different perceptual worlds. Um, they act in sensory realms and ranges that we just don't share. So can we ever really investigate the animal's perspective um, in, in such research? Or are we doomed only to taking the accounts of those who, who live and work with them? Or relying on the natural sciences, perhaps, for our, for our investigations? Um, if we decide it's impossible, then um, the, the animals in danger, perhaps, of becoming what Henry Buller called an abstract and textualised non-person. Um, in, in other words, you know, we're calling it multi-species ethnography because those animals are present in our research. Um, but the animal really just becomes another symbol in our, in our writing, another vehicle for, for human interpretation and human meaning making. Their perspective isn't really considered. And we could consider this an ethical problem, especially where questions of power and exploitation are, are so often involved. But if we try and claim that we understand what, we think, what they're thinking, um, then as Raymond Madden argues, we're, we're kind of in danger of an anything goes approach, right? Where we just uh, choose the, the interpretation <laughs> that best suits us, our interpretations, our, our own sort of belief systems and so on. 
And perhaps we, we then end up ignoring what's, what's perhaps irreducibly other and different about that animal. So it is difficult, um, that's, that's acknowledged, but plenty of scholars have argued that there's an ethical obligation to at least try and get closer. Uh, the politeness of paying attention, as, as Donna Haraway would put it, um, or listening for the voice of the animal, as, as Lindsay Hamilton and Nick Taylor uh, talk about. But uh, Hamilton and Taylor argue that this might involve some kind of methodological unsettling <coughs> um, and suggest that sensory methods, among other methods, might be of help. Um, they suggest that reinvigorating our own diversity of senses and recognising that vision is entangled with other senses, such as um, hearing and touch and smell and, and proprioception and kinesthetic awareness, helps us think about non-human human communication as another kind of discourse. They say, it's possible to see that by tuning into the movements that both we as humans and they make, their bodies and their senses can be interpreted as a form of communication, rethinking the very concept of discourse along sensory lines. Now that's quite ambitious, perhaps, to think about this as just another kind of discourse. But there are a number of studies that have explicitly used sensory multi-species methods, and a few of them are here if you want to, to look them up um, after. But I think um, what was particularly interesting about the work that emerged from one of my field sites with horses is its use of what was called the felt sense, a kind of a somatic, emotional, intuitive skill that nonetheless was considered a, a concrete, teachable method. There was nothing particularly mysterious about it. It was something that was judged that everybody could just kind of learn and become more familiar with. I'll argue that there might be something um, interesting for us to learn methodologically from this method. Um, I'll then note some of the ways in which these techniques overlap with the teaching of nonverbal uh, communication and acting training. And um, as I've said, I'll, I'll tell you briefly about some of the workshops, which I think has been mentioned a few times. So, um, OK. So one of my case studies um, for investigating methods of animal behaviour expertise uh, was at a site that I'm calling Equine Instinct. That's a, a pseudonym. Um, and it offers equine-assisted personal development. Um, now, they offer private sessions, uh, workshops, and three-day retreats for adults in a rural location in England. It's run by a facilitator called Erin. Um, she's a, an ex-competitive show jumper. Uh, she a, was a horse trainer and a horse dealer. She had her own yard. Uh, and she now has a herd of 14 horses that she keeps on an enormous and, and glorious plot of land, um, 110 acres. It's absolutely huge. They're never ridden anymore. She just uses them for this kind of work. And her mission is really twofold, to help people learn about horses on the one hand and to help people learn about themselves on the other through the use of what she calls our shared language with horses, the felt sense. So the felt sense is something that is understood to transcend species boundaries in, in this instance. And that's um, where it was. So what is equine assisted personal development? Um, well, in EAPD, uh, participants work with horses generally from the ground, so there's no riding at all involved. Um, it's not about therapy, but the, the, the aim is to gain insights into one's own patterns of behaviour um, and to develop skills like um, self-awareness, uh, communication skills, meeting life's challenges, uh, mindfulness techniques and that kind of thing. Horses seem to be uh, helpful with this because of a, a, a key foundational assumption in this site which is that as social animals and as prey animals, um, they are understood to be um, particularly sensitive readers of bodies and environments because they are tuned constantly to the presence of danger. And this is thought to make them uniquely good at reading and interpreting human behaviour as well. And because, it's, as it's often stated, um, horses don't lie, um, it's thought that they respond to the human's underlying emotional state very visibly and very immediately. So they almost act as a kind of extension of that human subjectivity in that space, making visible to the facilitator what might be more hidden to them uh, from, from view. And in turn, uh, the client can use the felt sense to calm down, to become more present with the horse, to find connection with them. And the idea is that the, the journey of learning to do that helps you address problematic aspects of yourself, such as um, a busy mind or um, lack of ability to trust 
or a uh, need to control a situation. So the two aims of equine instinct in this way, learning about horses and uh, learning about ourselves, are thoroughly intertwined. And there were um, a variety of activities that we did. Um, so uh, some of which involved, as you can see, hanging out um, with a herd in their field, um, grazing alongside them with our hands as a form of kind of companionship. Um, and um, observing their interactions and talking together a little bit about herd behaviour uh, and how they, how they work as a, as a group. Um, and that's me having a sort of very blissful uh, summer 2017. But um, there was really one core exercise that was important to the, to the whole uh, retreat. So in this exercise, um, some, of the field, some of the horses are brought up from the field to a kind of corral. Um, the participant is asked to go and choose their horse, uh, and then they're asked to say why they've chosen that particular horse. They're asked uh, what their intention is for this, for this particular session, um, and that might be something like working on trust, or it might be to, to find connection, or it might just be to, to be with the horse and observe the horse. Um, the person is on their own in the sandy arena, so if you're sort of the other participants, and this is the corral, um, the person would, would come in, Erin uh, then brings the horse into the, into the arena and the horse is released. So the horse is completely free during this interaction to move away or, or, or towards as it wishes. And there are then no rules of engagement at all. So Erin doesn't give any kind of directions about how to interact with the horse or what to do. She might occasionally ask them to, to notice what the horse is doing and to consider why. Um, but otherwise the, the work takes place generally in silence. And at the end, after about uh, 15 or 20 minutes, the person's asked to, to come back to the fence and, and we're, the rest of the participants are there. And they're asked to describe their experience and reflect upon why they made the choices that they did and why the horse might have made those choices as well. And the aim of these sessions was, was to um, better understand oneself and horses through getting familiar with what Erin called the felt sense, which is the subject of this talk. So, as I've already said, this is a form of um, almost craft-like embodied skill. Something which was thought to open up what Erin sometimes described as a clean communication with the horse. So here, rather than, um, rather than the mind being the, the instrument of inquiry, um, it was usually described, that it was usually talked about that the mind was, was in fact getting in the way of this clean communication. The cognitive mind was getting in the way of this clean communication. And instead, one's own body and one's emotions become the instrument of knowledge and the kind of barometer of assessment of a situation. And being personal development, you know, the, the, the journey was, was considered more important than the destination. But if there was a, a, a tacit aim, I guess it was to become um, quiet enough in the mind, quiet enough in the body, to become what she called energetically present with the horse. And so there's an opportunity for what she called connection. And for novice participants, this is often thought of um, as touch, connection through touch. Um, but as the retreat progressed, uh, connection began to be thought about in a slightly different way, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. Um, so, uh, I've got a couple of videos to show you um, that demonstrate how connection was conceived. So, um, this first one uh, is with a, a horse on a first encounter. So, a, a first encounter in a beginner's retreat. I see, watching it, he's doing nonchalant too, isn't he? I think I have a nibble of my tummy. Yes. Kind of standing there, I'm being nonchalant and he's being nonchalant. <laughs> am I looking away now? Yes, I am. See, I'm, I'm trying not to make eye contact. There I am, there I am, horse whispering. He's walking the opposite <laughs> direction. <laughs> I think I'm here, I was very conscious of trying to give him enough space to come to me. Right. So, to kind of, for him to be aware that I was there. Okay. But to give him the space. Um, I mean, looking at this, I think we actually are connecting because I, I, I think he's aware I'm there. How do you think, why do you think he's aware? 
because the ears, yeah. the ears were moving. He's now looking. Mm -hmm. um, he's kind of looking in that. His head's gone down. He's yawning. Oh, this is a drag. Right. Ah, now I put my hand out and he's actually mm -hmm. coming towards it. So I made an effort there, but having got to me, the ears have gone back. It's like it came towards my hand, but didn't want to be touched. The ears went back. Yeah. It was like, um, you know, I'll come, come near you. Was this towards the end, or was this? No, this no, is um, it really? it's quite close to the beginning, so right, we're okay. six minutes now. Right. The ears went forward and then back. But I think I'm responding to what his ears do more than anything else. Are you? Right. Yes. I, I think so, because if you notice, the moment the ears go back, I, I remove myself. Huh. So, um, as you can hear in this video, the talk's quite humorous in places, but the, the fantasy of controlling the encounter is, is, is still kind of there. You know, she talks in the beginning about horse whispering, you know. I, I've heard about horse whispering and I think we all kind of had the fantasy that we would just get into the arena and we would walk off and the horse would kind of follow us in this beautiful join up technique. Um, there's quite a lot of trying in her talk. She's trying to get the horse to come to her. Um, she's talking a lot about, um, she's heard that the ears uh, are often indicators of where the, the horse's attention is. So she's focusing on the ears. The ears are telling her when, when the horse is connecting and when the horse is not connecting. Um, and she's quite focused on being able to touch the horse for her connection in this state. Uh, I'll show you the next one. So what do you think is going on, going on for him now? I, I, it's fascinating really, isn't it? You know, he, he's just come and stood as close as possible pretty much with the occasional nudge of me. Hmm. Um, in almost like a, a protection type stance mm -hmm. compared to the rolling on the sand and the trotting round mm -hmm. or little Bobby still carrying on eating his grass <laughs> every opportunity. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it's almost impossible to know other than that he, he can sense the change in the energy that I've I'm concentrating, I'm like concentrating on not being there. Can you do that? <laughs> not what you mean. <laughs> Drawing everything um, in. She talks yeah, about yeah. yeah. Um, and shutting out all the other surrounds. But I, um, I think this, it sort of goes back to when we were talking about the movement of the herd with the leader in the middle and mm. directing the front of the herd by um, almost like a... a either a slight bodily pressure about the horses around you or some sort of um, thought process to the animal's head. Mm -hmm. he's, he would look like he's got some sort of connection with me and what I'm doing or going through, huh. but without words. Huh. Okay, so two quite different interactions there. Um, in that second uh, video, she's doing an exercise which Erin called going into neutral which means focusing your attention on a point on the floor for about 10 minutes and just keep bringing your attention back, keep bringing your attention back. So she's not interacting with the horse in that session. But as you can see, the horse was pretty content to be there. Um, and she's started, to, and actually the horse was there for about 10 or 15 minutes, I think, and was kind of nuzzling the back of her head. Um, and she started to conceive of a, a different kind of connection, one without touch, one without words. And of course, we don't really know what was going on for the horse um, at, at that particular moment. These were two different horses, two different days. But it gives a, a kind of sense of the journey that the participants are going on in, in thinking about how connection is, is conceived. And I would say that this journey was facilitated by a number of key skills, which I will talk to you about now. So, first one I would say was um, throwing away the species rule book. Um, so a kind of comfort with uncertainty about what uh, the horse's uh, gestures meant. Um, and in most scientific practices of animal behaviour, of course, uh, there's quite stringent species-specific guidance about the meaning of certain gestures. Um, 
about the, the, the different codes of the position of the, of the, the ears or the, or the tail or whatever. But Erin rarely offers her interpretation of the horse's responses to the person that they're working with. Instead, she asks you to use your own judgment. She just throws the question back to you. Um, and last, asks you lots of kind of open-ended questions to kind of encourage you to, to closely observe. So, for example, in the arena, if the horse starts kind of like licking and chewing, she might ask you what you think that means in the context of your interaction. Um, or when we enter the field with the horses, she might start by asking us what we think might be the good qualities of a herd leader um, and asking us to spend the session seeing if we can guess who the, the herd leader is based on the, the discussion that we then have with her. So she does bring in her interpretation occasionally, and of course, if there's a safety issue, she, she definitely does, but generally, it's, it's brought back to you. And she says, um, I think there's a general over, overall communication between all species. And that's what I'm trying to tap into and work with, with people and with myself. It's like, it's just a common thing. Is there tension being held in the body or not? Is the horse moving away or not? It's something that anyone can see. You don't have to train, but somehow all the people want to know, to know is, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? Well, you've got to look at the whole context, but also feel it. And clients found that quite uh, unmooring and unsettling at first. They often kind of wanted some instruction and, and they latched onto things like the, the meaning of the ears. But for, for Erin, this, this uncertainty and this vulnerability, and to a certain extent, a bit of fear, um, is what sharpens your intuition and your observational skills. Um, the second quality of the felt sense uh, was sensory curiosity, or what Bruno Latour might call learning to be affected by new information coming through a, a kind of reconfigured use of the senses. So we would spend time um, isolating our, our, our senses in turn, um, maintaining our attention on each one for a few minutes, so practicing, or if we just listen to what we can hear, and keep our attention on that for a minute, how does the experience change? Or, um, you know, if we just, or if we think about fields of vision, so uh, we would sit practicing seeing things just with our peripheral vision rather than with a, a narrow directed field of vision. And then what happens if you take that into the work with the horses? So um, how does that change your experience and perhaps help you attune to the different kinds of phenomena that they're experiencing and that they're offering you? So um, she also encouraged um, close visual observation by working with us on this on a boundary exercise. So getting us to notice and respect, um, first of all, our own personal space and then the horse's sense of personal space. So that we could sort of spot those signs that the horse was uncomfortable with us a little bit earlier. And she also encouraged us to spend time with them um, in other ways other than touching and, and stroking them. So the grazing is an example of that. It's a companionable activity which we could do alongside, which connects us with the ground and with the earth and with them and their activities, but it doesn't involve um, petting. And the third skill I would say is called uh, getting into the body. So because um, the behavioural expression of the horses seem to be inextricably tied up with one's own emotional state and behaviour in that moment, which might also colour your own interpretations of that interaction. Erin tries to encourage self-awareness through um, embodied sensation. So before we went in with the horses, we would always do a body scan through the body first, closing our eyes and, and running our attention through our body to find areas of tension or release or emotion. Um, if somebody felt emotional, say the horse just kept walking away and they felt a little bit kind of rejected, she would ask them straight away, where are you feeling it in your body? Um, she would ask you what it feels like and she would ask you to reflect upon, oh, okay, so how the, might that be changing your behaviour or how might that have changed the, the, um, the horse's response to you? So in other words, in, in learning about horses, the horse isn't uh, a kind of object of study which we remove ourselves from and, and objectively observe. Um, it's recognised that in uh, Desprez's words, we are affected and affecting in our interactions with the horse. So we co-produce each other essentially in that, in that moment. Uh, and the last way of, of finding the, the felt sense was through finding a present moment state. Um, so this was a kind of quality of attention, if any of you are familiar with meditation or, or mindfulness techniques, where you're not thinking about, you know, 
what you've just done or what you should be doing or what you're going to do in a few minutes' time, but you're there completely present and absorbed in the moment and absorbed in whatever's in front of you. Um, and this was understood to be important because she thought it was the place of, of greatest receptiveness, essentially. Um, so an important exercise here was, was what I've just described a little bit earlier, was this neutral exercise. So spending maybe 10 or 15 minutes just working on your breathing and bringing your attention back to the point, bringing your attention back to the point on the floor um, before you even looked at the horse in that interaction. So, how did it help me learn about horses? Um, of course, in, the, in this uh, situation, you know, I'm, I'm learning a somatic practice that I'm also sociologically evaluating. Um, and there are certainly some critical questions to ask here. So we might uh, see this idea of the body-mind division as a little bit simplistic. Um, we might question this assumption that because the horse is a prey animal, that they're fundamentally always orientated towards us and our behaviour. Um, and we still don't really know for certain, of course, what's going on in the horse's mind. But firstly, I, I think I'd say that it's undoubted that these skills for me changed the kinds of relationship that I was having with the horses. Um, they became a thousand times more present in my research. Um, and I think there just began to be this, this really kind of incredible level of, of, of trust that was built up that I could, that I could you know, build up relatively quickly. And even though I was working with um, a different horse every time uh, and at quite sporadic intervals, maybe over six months or so, I started to understand in a very embodied way what she meant by clean communication and connection. Um, I'll be able to get myself into a very calm, kind of meditative state and the horse would then enter that as well. And then, you know, you'd be sort of hanging out together in the, in, in the arena and you'd kind of turn to look at the horse, go like, oh, this is cool, isn't it? And the horse would turn to look back at you and suddenly it would just hit you, like, the horse has seen me, like, there's a, we've got a connection. Just something would happen and I can't really explain it. Um, and I think, you know, a, a, couple, of, a couple of horses um, that really didn't like being touched or approached at all, so, so Erin wouldn't work with them at all with beginners, began to accept me and began to accept touch from me because I would gradually get to know when it was okay and, uh, and when it wasn't. Um, once or twice, uh, even after just about 10 or 15 minutes, we'd, we'd be in this, this sort of state together and the horse would just kind of lie down and go for a doze, um, which was maybe a bit of a dubious honour, but I'm, I'm told it's a, an unusual one. Um, and um, and I did, you know, I did at one point, again, I'm, you're never certain what's going on here, but I did at one point get the, the horse whispering fantasy where I was 10 or 15 minutes in, in uh, this, this neutral position and I was with a, with a pony and I got up and I started walking away and the horse just started following me and I got a bit overexcited and I started running <laughs> and the horse started running after me. I was like, oh my God, this is just amazing. You know, so we spent sort of five minutes really just following each other um, around, the, around the arena. And I, you know, I don't think it was just me. I don't know. I mean, I think that the other, other participants started to, because obviously I've been doing it for some time by the end of my research, other participants started to say that they thought that something, maybe something special was, was happening. And um, I looked up from one encounter and, and one of the participants was in tears. And um, the facilitator, you know, started to talk about me, you know, maybe being good to help rehabilitate other horses and stuff. So over the time of doing this research, I actually found that my own embodied skills started to, started to change. But also for in terms of my actual research, I think this opened up a world for me where I just became attuned to different things. So um, I learned that despite what I'd heard about staying clear of a horse's hindquarters, um, that if you were sitting down and a, a horse sort of backed into you, that that was actually something of a compliment. Not because I've been told that, but because I gradually sort of learned what was safe behaviour and what the horse's intentions were uh, and what wasn't safe behaviour. Um, I started to be able to read slight differences in their bodily intentions. So uh, I gradually got to know the difference between a horse kind of walking towards you because, you know, he or she wanted to say hello and a horse walking towards you because they were like, well, why are you in my field and I'm going to barge right through you because, you know, this is my place and get out of it. You know, this kind of dominant behaviour which they sometimes show. Um, that took a while um, and I was nearly trampled a couple of times. Um, uh, and I learned to... 
I learned it, the difference really between a horse that was just kind of relaxed and resigned to, to being there um, and a horse that was relaxed and interested in my company and, and happy to be with me. So something was, was definitely happening and I think has continued to happen as I um, meet other horses and other animals. Um, and my participants agreed. Um, and uh, some of them say that this made them consider the social relations of power. So Cathy says, I think what I've learned is that they're way more intelligent than I, than I would have perhaps have thought. Just observing their behaviour and how they interact with each other, I think the whole herd mentality, the way they organise themselves and look out for each other, I think is fascinating. I'd never really given it a lot of thought as to what was going on or how that horse was even relating to the other horses in the stables, so she writes. It has made me think about, you know, the level of cruelty it feels like. And I should say at this point that at no point was this retreat ever about not riding or riding was cruel or anything like that. But it was, it was notable that a lot of the participants started to reflect on riding schools and the very different relationships that were happening in riding schools. Now, um, a, a criticism might be that these practices are quite um, compelling emotionally uh, and that, um, you know, it, that they made me go native and, and lose my critical faculties. But in fact, I think, I think I made the argument that the, that the opposite happened. Um, I certainly think that participating in these activities meant that I couldn't easily critique these, uh, these practices just as abstract ideas. But at the same time, I think it actually deepened my, my critical assessment because I could interrogate the gap between what I was being asked to do and what that felt like. Um, and also because I could start, start to see a difference between what I was seeing in the horse and what the participants were seeing in the horse or sometimes being encouraged to see in the horse. And that made me able to ask questions about the gap um, between those two things, which was quite productive in the end. And I also found to a certain extent that I was be able to translate this idea of the felt sense across species and across contexts. So um, that's the subject of an another talk maybe, but I, I used these techniques to um, see what I could learn about Erin's not very sociable uh, or not very human sociable uh, sheep. Um, I spent two days in a muddy field in November um, following the sheep around and, uh, and trying to get them to build up a, a relationship of trust with me. Um, so that I could learn something, um, something about them as individuals, something about the way that they operated in the herd. Um, and eventually, uh, in the last sort of 20 minutes of my two-day session, I was successful and I got to a stage where the flock were just kind of happy to, to be around me and I was able to learn and take back some things to, to Erin. And even though it was much more difficult, I was able to take some of this sensory work into my next case study um, in the Animal Research Laboratory. Um, kind of using my senses, doing the work on uh, isolating the different senses um, and trying to do present moment stuff with, with the mice in their cages, although really that taught me more about everything that wasn't possible. Um, and that helped me think about why, what the practical and the epistemological uh, obstacles were in that situation. So in summary, um, I've argued that there's a, a good case for considering the, the multiple ways in which non-human animals enter our social life, um, in ways that are very obvious and visible and in ways that aren't. Um, I've suggested that we don't necessarily need to think about subjectivity and conscious intention in order to do multispecies ethnography, but that both sociologists and scientists argue that, that many non-human animals do have subjectivity and do have intersubjectivity, even in a relatively conventional definition of the social. I've suggested that multi-species ethnography is one way uh, in which social researchers are investigating the complexities of human-animal interactions. But that, um, the, the, the question of the animal's experience in that research site is obviously a methodological problem. Sensory methods are perhaps one way of starting to address this, this problem, no matter how problematically, no matter how partially. And I've given an example from my own ethnographic research about how something called the felt sense has been used to become more sensitive to non-verbal and multisensory communication of non-human animals by embracing uncertainty, practicing sensory curiosity, becoming more aware of embodied sensations and practicing a present moment state. And I've started to explore um, whether I could take some of what I learned from my field site uh, into a methodological framework for social research with non-human animals. So if as a sociologist, you know, or an anthropologist or, or wherever we might come from, you know, we train in interview techniques, we train in ethnography, we don't just leave it to our field sites, then perhaps there are techniques that we can learn to be able to get closer to the animals that we're studying without restraining them. 
um, to be more sensitive to non-verbal non communication, and also to be more reflective about how what I'm bringing to that research site might be impacting on the non-human others there. But of course, it's not always practical to work with animals. And then I realised that um, a lot of the skills that Erin teaches are actually quite familiar to me from my uh, training as, a, as an actor many years ago, um, where a lot, on, a lot of the work on um, a lot of work on non-human, sorry, a lot of the work on non-verbal communication um, is done between people uh, who, you know, newsflash are also animals. Um, so. A lot of uh, acting is, is fundamentally about developing a felt sense. Um, it's about curiosity and learning to be affected by the other person and what's going on in the scene with you. It's about tuning in and, and responding to small shifts in body language. It's about staying in a place of uncertainty. If your acting partner does something different that day, you don't go, oh my God, that's not how I rehearsed it. It's a gift, you work with it. Um, and it's about staying with a present moment quality of attention. Um, if you start thinking about what you're going to do next or, or how you're going to say your line, then the, the interaction just dies. It looks forced and it looks artificial. And there are lots of enjoyable kind of games and, and exercises which don't involve acting, they don't involve performing at all, but are designed to help develop a felt sense. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and some of you came, um, I, uh, I took some work from my previous training as an actor um, and put it together with some of the work that I learned here. Um, and I put together this workshop called, called Cultivating Curiosity, which is primarily about sensory methods, but also about um, multi-species methods. So we start with um, tuning into ourselves, and then we, we start with working with what's in the room, and then we start working with and becoming responsive to each other, and then we take that out into the park, uh, and we see what we can, we can find out about the non-humans that are around there too. Um, and I think it was really lovely what people came back with, even just uh, within half an hour at the park. You know, people talked about lovely encounters with squirrels and with, with tree roots and with the sounds of the rain. And um, somebody found some stuff that we could eat and brought it all back for us. And uh, it just really poured out of people. So there's another one next week um, and you should come. Um, no performing and no uh, quadrupeds, unfortunately. Um, but maybe just some time away from the writing and learning to use our senses in a different way. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening.